second invited talk of the workshop. Um, this is going to be by Joao Marcos from Brazil. Joao Marcos uh, is a logician and he has two PhD, one in mathematics from the Technical University of Lisbon and the other one a PhD in philosophy from the State University of Campinas in Brazil. He's currently an associate professor at the Department of Informatics and Applied Mathematics of Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Norte de Brazil and collaborates with Security and Quantum Information Group of the Instituto de Telecomunicaciones in Portugal. The talk he's going to, to give us today is titled uh, Understand the Negation Through the Model Logician Eyes. And I think we all are going to enjoy it. Please, Joao. Thank you very much, Lourdes. Um, I do hope you will enjoy, of course. But um, let me clarify that uh, when I put the Model Logician's Eyes, there will be lots of eyes actually uh, appearing here. Uh, just to recall how is it that the perspective of the non-classical logician uh, when approaching logic it's not to to uh, cancel logic itself or the standard approach to logic but uh, i would say that the important thing here is that uh, non-classical logician wants to understand the role of a standard assumption this assumption might be one from classical logic and the way that he's planning to understand it is by cancelling it and looking at how the world would be uh, if things were not to be like they are. So even if you're not a non-classical logician, I hope you will appreciate uh, the um, entertaining the possibility of looking at alternative worlds. And the best people to look at alternative worlds are the modal, modal logicians. So let's see uh, what we can do with modal logic. Uh, the uh, aim here is to study negation um, using these uh, glasses of a model logician. So we want to study by cancelling the assumptions of consistency or determinateness from the classical negation and study what would happen if negation were not to be classical. Now, I will uh, provide from the point of view of modal logic a uh, characterization of what it means to talk about a negative modality or uh, the modal approaches to uh, negation which are not necessarily classical and i will um, try to convince you that the scope is full in the sense that every normal modal logic for instance can be recaptured using these non-classical glasses and i will offer abstract definitions followed by some uh, semantical um, samples of those logics, a uh, lot of uh, those logics, um, and I will also offer some uh, proof theoretical study of them, in particular in terms of uh, Hubert calculi, but also sequent calculi with uh, very, which are very well behaved. So let's see what uh, how far we can go. Uh, as on the guise of motivation, let me start by saying that. Uh, not every modal logician uh, is looking for the same thing, but uh, we might claim that they are um, trying to capture some notion of synonymity. What do I mean by this? Well, just let's consider that two uh, formulas are, or two sets of formulas are called equivalent when from one of those sets you can prove all the formulas in the other set and vice versa. And uh, imagine that we want to go a little bit further and consider a logic, for instance, in which negation is not classical and actually negation is not explosive, so in which you could have a formula and its negation, a formula and its negation, and we want to consider where these two sets are equivalent. Well, as I said, the logic is power consistent. If these two sets were to be equivalent according to uh, the above definition, then in particular from this set you could derive any formula. So they would not be power consistent. So this uh, obviously tells us already that from the point of view of power consistent logic, not all contradictions or sets containing uh, a formula and its negation, contradictory formulas if you want to say, are equivalent. They cannot be. Actually, this uh, raised an interesting discussion in the literature, which I would just like to mention. The, in the 30s already, uh, Jeffries was publishing papers saying that, well, 
you see, uh, it's not very reasonable to suppose that uh, from a contradiction anything should follow. And then uh, people like Karl Popper uh, responded saying, look, you contradictions are so dangerous because uh, if you really, if you don't avoid them, science will collapse. All the people like Alan Turing were saying the same to Wittgenstein at the same time, bridges will fall, as is, if you might remember. Now, uh, this uh, became a conversation in the literature and Jeffries uh, clarified, similar to what I said above, that uh, what he was saying was just that not all contradictions are the same. If perhaps you allow some of them to be tolerated, perhaps, uh, you do not need to commit to tolerate all of them. And then Popper said, oh, great, uh, I actually thought, I mean, a bit later, of a system in which these uh, would happen, in which uh, contradictions would not explode. But it happened that my system was too weak and I abandoned it. So he just abandoned the possibility uh, or the, the chance of becoming one of the, of the forerunners of paraconsistent logic, his choice. But um, maybe uh, other systems, different from the one he has considered, wouldn't be too weak? Imagine that. Well, let's see what happens if we explore this a little bit further. A lot of people have done it, so let's see what happens in particular if you want to make this equivalence more than just an equivalence. So imagine that we have a, a, a context here will be just a formula with a hole, and in that hole I put either phi or psi. Now, if it happens that the formula applied to phi and the formula applied to psi in that context are equivalent, we extend our notion of equivalence to C equivalence, equivalence under that context. Of course, the context could be an atom containing no connective, so it would coincide with the previous definition for the case of a single formula. Now, uh, what we are really interested on is uh, in the situations in which equivalence actually becomes contagious and in which uh, two formulas being equivalent is enough for us to say that they are indistinguishable. So that is the case in which we call uh, formulas uh, synonymous. We say that the uh, being equivalent is uh, sufficient for us to be able to prove that they can be replaced one by the other. And that's the very definition of congruentiality. Uh, for a given connective, say, for, for a given formula with a, with a um, unary uh, character, so with a whole. And if I want to say that a logic is congruent, I just say that this happens for any context, for any formula. Equivalence implies synonymity. Now, I claim here that um, this is one of the main properties characterizing uh, model logic. So uh, the replacement property is one at least that one we would expect to find in what's uh, known in the literature as classical model logics, which is not the same as uh, normal model logics. Uh, they are connected to uh, semantic, in semantical terms, having a neighborhood semantics, while the normal model logics will have a cryptic semantics, like the ones that I will actually uh, explore later on in this talk. But it's also interesting to notice that the um, the notion of congruentiality, which is so dear to model logic, is actually stronger than the notion of extensionality, which is stronger than the notion of truth functionality. Okay, so uh, we are imposing a lot, but we want to study logics which are not so exotic, so it's not a problem that we do that. Now, um, one might say that this has been done before. Um, Paraconsistent logics which are model have been studied before. What could we say, for instance, about the first paraconsistent logic in the literature, which was proposed as, as non-explosive, proposed to be paraconsistent by Stanislav uh, Yashkovsky, the logic D2? Well, I claim that this is a false start, and precisely because this logic is not congruential. But, well, it was defined originally in terms of a model logic, S5. And the way it was defined by, was by way or through two uh, translations composed this one and this one. So uh, this green translation here, what it does is to process the connectives in such a way that you will be able to recover the uh, positive fragment of classical logic. And uh, the other translation on top of it is putting a diamond in front of every formula after you translate. And this is a way of saying that while well, we're taking into account different agents or different moments in a discourse, so this was the original motivation of Yashkovsky, uh, 
And one, one might say, well, it was defined in terms of S5, a model logic, so here is a model logic. And I say it's not. Why do I say that? Well, as I said, because you could, for instance, define a certain formula, say, classical negation of A, and uh, you can prove that uh, the atom P, uh, it's equivalent to the, its double negation according to this new negation that I just defined, yet the power consistent uh, negation of this atom P is not equivalent to the power consistent negation of this double negation of P, so congruentiality fails and D2 is not a modal logic according to my uh, main requirement to identify anything as being modal. You might not agree with that requirement, but then you might not also uh, want to have Kripke semantics, which I do have, uh, which I do want to have. So this was a false start in a certain sense, um, but we can do, go a little bit further. Uh, in fact, it's uh, the, the, the result that was proved uh, about D2, uh, it follows for any logic in which uh, from the negation of an implication, uh, um, you can prove uh, this co-implication here, this A and not B. Now, this is a uh, very common, especially if your implication and conjunction behave classically, but what I'm saying is that this is enough for uh, uh, the proof that uh, an extension of positive classical logic um, fails congruentiality. Okay, so uh, what can we do? Let's go a little bit further then and discuss the possibility of having a paraconsistent logic with congruentiality. Now, um, what I want is something like this that whenever psi falls from phi, I want to have something which allows me to reverse this and to put psi on the left and phi on the right. So imagine that negation were to be this context. This is a sort of contraposition, which is very common in many logics. One might wonder if paraconsistent logics can survive to that property, so if they can have that property, if they can be negation reversing for their power consistent negation. Now, in general, I want to consider not only the power consistent negation, but also the power complete, negative modalities, but I haven't introduced them yet, so I have to uh, stay uh, talking about this uh, first example. But as you will see after I introduce negative modalities, they will be examples, they exist, and there will be examples of. Uh, context that allow for this uh, global version of contraposition. And of course, uh, once you allow for this, you immediately get for uh, having this and its converse, you have this and its converse, so you have congruentiality, right? So you have that equivalence implies synonymity. Okay, so as I said, the question is whether a power consistent logic could be reversing uh, in that sense. And for many uh, uh, in years in the literature, it, uh, a lot of people seem to believe that it wasn't possible. And actually, they had many examples of logics in which this uh, was not a uh, property. So they thought, well, as my logic doesn't have this property, no logic will. Uh, okay, but let's go a little bit uh, further and, and see uh, what the kind of criticisms that we found already in, in the early literature of, about this. I said that we, I'm looking for a sort of contraposition, so you might imagine that contraposition is formulated like this, in terms of a certain notion of consequence. Now, uh, Popper already said that, you see, my logic was so weak because, precisely, I couldn't have this thing inside. And the reason he couldn't have is very simple. He could uh, build a, a reasoning in which he uses reflexivity and cut, plus uh, implication introduction and implication elimination. So the implication of intuitionistic logic, for instance, or any deductive implication would have this property in which from this local version of contraposition, he could derive pseudoscotus. So the logic would not be paraconsistent, at least for negated formulas. Okay, so it wouldn't be boldly paraconsistent as we say it nowadays. Okay, so uh, you might be willing to abandon reflexivity or cut or some of the rules for implication. I will do nothing like that in this talk. I will actually abandon this local version of contraposition, which because we don't need it. We need something else, which is this, for having congruentiality. Now, let me give you an example of how we can easily attain this, uh, this goal. Uh, one way is the, like this. 
uh, imagine that we were to define then a negation in model terms by saying that the negation, this is a smiling negation, a very happy one, uh, is satisfied in a world X of a model M if and only if there is some world accessible to X such that in that world phi is false. So if there is some possible situation, some accessible world in which phi is false. You might have seen something similar to that or dual to that in intuitionistic logic, for instance, but let's consider this for the moment. Okay, now imagine that we were to define using this uh, smile, this negation, uh, the formula that I call bottom as being the negation of P implies P. Well, in that case, you will be able to prove semantical, uh, in semantical terms that this formula actually behaves like the bottom in classical logic. So it actually deserves that name. And you could, from that bottom, define a classical negation. From that classical negation, you can define a box using the combination of two negations. You can then define a diamond, which are not just any box and any diamond. These are precisely unary connectives that behave in this interpretation as the interpretation of box and diamond in normal modal logic. And you can define another negation that I call here frown, a very sad negation, which is intuitionistic-like or paracomplete. And I can define other things like the uh, consistency operator, which will appear later on in this talk very briefly. Okay, now uh, one thing that I wanted to mention about this is that it's easy to prove in this case if you give this definitions from this smile and this classical implication that the logics that we define here are reversing with respect to any of the negations that I put here. Classical, paraconsistent, paracomplete. And indeed, this negation, the smile, is paraconsistent and this negation, the, dime, the uh, frown, is paracomplete. Now, uh, the other thing you might consider is uh, what happens then if I want to recover normal model logics? Well, actually, this box and this diamond behaves as they should. And as I said, you can recover normal model logics. And uh, the converse is also the case, as I will mention later on. You can prove that these negations and all the connectives in this logic are congruential, so they have all the right to be called modal. And because of this last uh, thing here, they have also the right of be called of called um, logics of formal inconsistency. Okay, now uh, let me consider uh, what happens if we don't have that implication to start with. Okay, because this was the main thing. I started from it and I smile and I did everything out of it. So let's see. First of all, let's let's show the easy solution in terms of a classical implication. Now. Um, were I to axiomatize the usual normal modal logics, I have heard in a previous talk today that uh, modal logic is usually classical. I want to claim that it's, this is just as true as saying that it's usually paraconsistent or always paraconsistent, if you want, in, at least in the case of normal modal logics. And how can I show that? Well, imagine I were to take uh, this single axiom that I call K, right? it's a form of De Morgan rule, on top of uh, positive classical logic, and add these two rules uh, to obtain something that behaves the way I want as a congruential uh, uh, smile. Now, in that case, um, I can go a little bit further and claim that the logic uh, K that I just axiomatized here is just another version of the usual normal modal logic K in a different signature. And uh, that signature, of course, has conjunction, disjunction, implication, and the smile, but doesn't have the, the, the negation from classical logic, doesn't have a box, doesn't have a diamond. Because as I showed before in the previous slide, these can all be defined. Now, if I want to go a little bit further and uh, look at other normal modal logics, I can consider adding further axioms like A or not A, which uh, happens to impose, impose reflexivity in our frames, or add double negation elimination, which is connected to the symmetry of our frames. And many other properties can be captured by writing some uh, formulas about negation, either uh, the smile or the frown, or both together.
Now, what I'm saying here is that uh, you could do this or you could do the opposite. So you could uh, start from the normal model language and define this language that I just presented here, but also you could start from my language and define the normal model language. Okay, so let's uh, look at this from a semantical viewpoint. Um, I want to consider a, a, a language which has just what I need, and as you have seen, I just need uh, implication and uh, the smile. Implication is defined here locally as the classical implication in a world W, and the smile, as we have seen before, uh, as, asks us to look at some world in which the formula is false. Okay, um, I claimed that we could recover uh, the classical negation, and this is a way you could do that directly. This formula will, will always behave as a classical negation uh, given the above definitions. And this formula will always behave like a box. So now, if you were to start from negation and box, how could you define that smile? Well, that's very simple. The smile can be taken as being the negation of the box which is what you probably already read from its interpretation. It says that it's not true that this will always be, tr be, be the case. So uh, there is some world in, in the future in which this formula will not be the case. So it's the negation of a uh, box. Now, if you can define one language from the other, we could also rewrite the history and say that normal modal logics has always been about the study of power consistency and that just by chance people got uh, charmed by uh, boxes and diamonds, but they could have uh, all the way have studied the language containing uh, these connectives that I have here, in particular to contain just uh, a classical implication and uh, power consistent negation. Now, as I said, uh, this is a bit too easy because classical negation is there. What if you want to do it intu intuitionistically? You have to change things, right? Now, one thing I wanted to mention is that there are some interesting connections that are reasonable to uh, expect. For instance, that classical negation is stronger than power consistent negation, in the sense that from a, a, a negated formula, a power consistently negated formula, you wouldn't always be able to conclude that the, that the formula is classically false. And uh, as I said, I want to consider the situation in which I don't have an implication. So from now on in this talk, you will see that I want to consider the language in which probably all of us will agree in the interpretations on conjunction, disjunction, top, bottom, the language of distributive lattices with their classical interpretations, which is the same as their intuitionistic interpretations, by the way. Okay, so let's see how far we can go. But for that, first I want to study what it means to call a connective, a unary connective, a negation. Now, we could start from classical negation and say, well, uh, classical negation uh, is this thing over here. But we have also other options of unary connectives in classical logic. And um, it's easy to see that because this is too valued, that uh, whenever two formulas are equivalent and you apply any of these four unary uh, operators, they're still equivalent. So all of them are congruential with respect to the classical notion of equivalence. Now, what else can you say? Well, some of them uh, preserve uh, the direction of consequence. So if beta follows from alpha, then the uh, connective applied to beta follows from the connective applied to alpha. Now, uh, this is the case for all the connectives here, but negation. And what about the uh, reversal, which was the thing I was interested in, the thing in which you change positions. Beta follows from alpha, and then you apply a connective to alpha, and it follows from that connective applied to beta. Well, in that case, all the, the operators here would uh, have that property of reversal, except for the affirmation or identity connective, if you prefer. Okay, and how do they interact with conjunction and disjunction? In a very simple way. Uh, imagine you're talking about preservation. You have things like, right here, uh, alpha conjunction beta then um, alpha, like conjunction elimination. From conjunction elimination, 
put here in this position, you would be able to conclude that a connective applied to conjunction of A and B has that connective applied to alpha, which is what I wrote here for this case. Now, this is obvious. If you want to keep conjunction elimination, you will have this interaction in between the uh, preservation connectives and conjunction. And if you want to have, on the other hand, um, uh, if you want to study reversal, then if you have uh, disjunction introduction, then you will have things like this, always being the case. Okay, so um, these two interactions here are always to be expected when anything is preserving truth from left to right. Uh, and uh, these two are to be expected when, uh, when you are reversing the direction of truth. Okay, so this is very simple, if, at least if you do want to have anything that looks like a classical conjunction and a classical disjunction in the language. Now, let me just repeat this here. These are the things that were in the previous slide. Now, I want to study in general what would it mean to call something a box and a diamond. And I'm still thinking about the uh, usual boxes and diamonds. Now, uh, one might consider rev uh, the converse of these two um, principles. And that's what I write here. Now, in case you do have these two things, so not only you have what you had before that you always have, but you also have the converse then I will say that this is a, a box plus connective. And in case you have the other one here, I will say that you have, when you have these two principles, that you have a box, oh, sorry, a diamond plus connective. Now, if you have more, in the, uh, I said you would, you would consider also top and bottom. So if you have a top and you also have this, then I will say that it's a full box plus and if you have a bottom and you have this, you have a full diamond plus. Now, I'm not interested in boxes and diamonds, but if you know them, you will certainly recognize that the box in normal model logic has these properties. If you put it in the place of the plus, and you will recognize that the diamond in model logic has these properties if you put it in the place of plus. Now, let's look at what happens with the minus because I want reversal. So this is what I had in the previous slide, and this is what I'm trying to add. So I had some De Morgan rules, and now I'm now considering the converse of the same rules. Now, I will say that whenever I have these things in here, I have a box minus unary connective. And whenever I have these things in here, I have a diamond minus connective. Now, you might say that you have never seen a box minus or a diamond minus. Well. I claim you have at least seen a box minus if you have studied intuitionistic logic, but okay, let's just go uh, um, dualizing the previous definition, see how far we can go. Now, this uh, further uh, sequence here or consecution here is to say that the negation of a bottom is actually a theorem. And this one is saying that the negation of a top is an anti-theorem. Whenever you have all this, I will say that it's a full box minus, and whenever you have all this, it's a full diamond minus connective. Okay, uh, you might say that there is no, um, no reason for me to believe that this minus is a negation just because I call it a minus. Well, here is a, 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 there are some um, criteria for recognizing something that deserves the name of negation. And I might just uh, give a particular case here, which is I want in general to be able uh, to get a formula P to be true and its negation to be false. And here, this is saying that I want at least to have a case in which a formula P is false and its negation is true. Okay, so these are the kind of things you would uh, be looking for if you want to call something a negation. I won't dwell too much on this, but I will use it later on to say that the thing that I'm presenting to you deserves the name of negation. Okay, so uh, very briefly to put all, all this together and to see how they interact. Imagine we had classical negation around, we had box plus, we had uh, uh, diamond plus, box minus, diamond minus. Then we would be able to, uh, uh, to prove these equivalences that I wrote here, which are what you would probably expect. These uh, representing the duality between box and diamond, both at the plus 
and at the minus versions of box and diamond. And you can put all this together in a, a single diagram and, uh, and study this, uh, the, the relations in between these, um, these connectives and, and contrariety, contradictory, uh, duality relations, subcontrariety relations between these connectives. So you see here that, the, that our uh, smile is here and our frown is here and box and diamond are here. Okay. Now, I want to uh, say a little bit more about the uh, non-classical behavior very briefly. I can uh, come back to this later on and what else we could add to the, to the language. Uh, if we had these two properties here of what I call explosion and implosion for a given unary connective, then you have the right of calling this connective a class conjugation because this is enough for characterizing class conjugation. But in case the first property fails, you say that the negation is paraconsistent. Uh, and in case the other one fails, uh, the comma there is read as a disjunction, if you prefer, or in multiple conclusion version, uh, you have the right of calling the logic paracomplete. Now, in case the logic is paraconsistent, you might still want it to be able to recover classical reasoning. So you might be able, you might be wanting to, uh, in case you have a contradiction and you know that this formula behaves consistently, that anything follows. And uh, you might want to add other things like um, um, you not only want the, uh, the formula to, uh, to, be, the, to be inconsistent when, the, when, it, when P not, and not P is simultaneously true, but you also want the converse. You want also to, for it to be consistent when this doesn't happen. For in that case, you would add uh, other things like these two other um, as I said, the disjunctions uh, to uh, our, your consequence relation. So this is a, an abstract art characterization of what I call a classic-like consistency connective. And the one uh, down here is a characterization of its dual, the uh, undeterminateness connective. Now, what you can do with it, we can uh, go into it, but I think it's not what you expect me to be doing here. So I just uh, briefly mentioned that they are some way of recovering by internalizing uh, the um, properties of those connectives in, in classical logic. So recovering normal behavior, if you want to call this normality. It's similar to what happens in hybrid logics when you add things to the language so that you're able to express an important property, say satisfiability, uh, which is so important to modal logic and the language, so you extend it. Okay, so um, let me talk about the modal semantics then. Now, I gave you a completely abstract characterization of what is a negative modality. Now, I want to give you examples of negative modalities. So this definition you have seen before, it's the definition of uh, the uh, smile that I have used uh, before, and I have uh, mentioned that it was a paraconsistent uh, negation uh, in normal modal logics if they're non-degenerate. And uh, this is the dual, if you want, you just look here and say, well, the negation, the frown negation of phi is true at a world when every world in the future, every world accessible to it uh, has this formula false, which is precisely the interpretation of negation in intuitionistic logic. This is the same as what I wrote up here. Now, um, as I said, it's easy to prove that if we're not talking about uh, uh, thinly disguised versions of classical logic and normal modal logic, so non-degenerate -degen modal logics, these negations will be, um, the smile will be paraconsistent, and moreover, it will be a diamond minus, a full type diamond minus connective, while the frown will be uh, paracomplete, but also actually uh, an example of a full box minus connective, according to the definition, the abstract definition that I gave before. And you can also uh, define the adjustment connectives that I mentioned in the previous slide, the consistency connective, the determinedness or undeterminedness connective. And they will capture uh, what you uh, need to uh, say that this is an example of the abstract definitions from the previous slide. Uh, and they're pretty useful as we will see. Okay, so let's see, I'm going with time, that's fine. So. Let me, let me just mention one more thing about class conjugation and how it would uh, interact with this um, in the modal environment with these other negations. Well, you would expect class conjugation to have this local character, 
in a world W, the formula negate, the negated formula is true if and only if in that very world the formula without the negation is false. And it's useful to think of class conjugation. As you see, uh, it is still there has two parts. One part is a smile and one part is a frown. So it's like if you uh, force things uh, to uh, behave in such a way that they were nicely behaved in, 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 in terms of implosion and nicely behaved in terms of explosion, it's actually classical. Um, and some interesting things that you can write then is, and I wrote before, were uh, these uh, duality uh, things about the box minus and diamond minus. But also you can use, if in the language you have a class conjugation, you can use it to do some other kinds of dualities like the power complete negation of the class conjugation is equivalent to the class conjugation of the power consistent negation and so on. And as I said before, you might expect these things uh, to hold, you might expect a paracomplete negation, a constructive negation if you want, to be stronger than class conjugation and a paraconsistent negation to be weaker. So you might expect this to be the case and the converses of these two consequations to fail. Now what I want to consider, as I said, is not the situation in which you have everything available and you have a classical implication and so on. So the language that I will consider from now on has this classical connectives, has the two negative modalities that I have introduced and also has these two uh, adjustment connectives, but doesn't have class conjugation, doesn't have classical implication. Let's see what we can do with it. Okay, um, I presented already some Hubert calculi. I didn't claim that it were interesting at all, but I said I could capture this logic PK with an implication uh, with a Hubert calculus. I want to present a more interesting one uh, calculus now. Uh, for us to study uh, in terms of uh, a sequence presentation. Now, we can go very briefly into this because these things here are all what you would expect from um, sequent calculus for the positive fragment of classical logic. Uh, these two rules here are interesting. They are rules for the smile and the frown. And as you can see, they have two interesting uh, properties. They have first, um, you have only one site the uh, smile can only allow you to take things from the left to the right, while the frown takes things from the right, oh, sorry, from the right to the left, while the, the frown takes things from the left to the right. But the other interesting property is that not only these formulas, which are the, the main formulas, change sides, but also the sequent contexts also change site and they also get a negation in front of them. Each formula inside the context is negated. And these two other rules here, they are not anomalous at all. They're just rules to say that um, this adjustment connectors behave uh, classically. They make absolutely no sense if the logic is consistent, because if it's consistent, uh, this uh, is, uh, smile with the ball here behaves like top. And if the logic is complete or determined, this guy here, the smile with the frown, behaves like the bottom. So these are only interesting if you're studying logic which are not classical. Now, one thing I wanted to, to say is that uh, by writing things uh, this way, you can use a very interesting technology that, that has been developed by uh, Uri Lahav and Arnon Avron. Uh, in which they look at this kind of sequence and they can extract a semantics directly from that formulation and prove some interesting properties about it. So let me uh, show uh, how to do it. So, uh, for instance, uh, if you think about the rules for uh, conjunction on the left and on the right, they can be described by cutting them in two parts. The first part is, uh, says what happens with the main sequence, which is this part formula and the other formula and the conjunction and the other is says what happens with the context sequence which is gammas and the deltas the side formulas of this and the way that you describe this if we had time to go very uh, 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 briefly through this is that you write like this you say p1 and p2 in the place of phi and psi on the left of the of the sequence symbol and then you write p1 conjunction p2 as the output on the left of the sequence symbol, and so on. 
But there is one thing new here is that besides this, you write the context. And the context can also be described. The context says that, well, gamma on the left, gamma on the left, becomes gamma on the left. And the same thought for delta on the right. Delta on the right becomes delta on the right. Okay? I'm just going through this because I want to say that there is a machine that will run on top of this and that will allow me to extract the semantics. The only difference that you see, for instance, when you have a, 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 a rule like the rule for smile, is that the context will be also putting uh, connectives. So the gamma on the left, the gamma on the left, will become a negated gamma on the right, a negated gamma on the right. So you can pretty much describe this in a way that actually uh, has been used to implement this uh, in software, very, uh, very simply. But I want to, to, uh, to say that this has a connection to semantics. So one thing that, uh, that has been discovered is that when you write things like this, you can uh, directly from that expression induce appropriate semantic conditions. So uh, the, the rule for a uh, smile on the left, for instance, induces this condition. We don't need to read it now. What's important is that this somehow magically happens. And the context pi1 induces this uh, condition, also a semantic condition. And it's very, very easy to see that these two conditions together give us precisely the semantics of the smile from the start. So this is a way that we might be used to claim that we are capturing smile by way of, um, of sequent uh, calculus rules. Actually, in this case, just one rule. Okay, now let me put this uh, here for us to rewrite it a little bit. Uh, it's easier for me, instead of writing that uh, not phi is satisfied in a world W of a model M, just to say that Assume we know what model M we're talking about, I'll write this. Phi is true in a world V. So I will say this to say that there is a valuation that takes that world, takes that formula, and says that it's true there. Fully deterministic. And similarly, I will introduce this to say that it's false at that world W. You see, this will be useful for me to express uh, uh, what's going to happen in the following for uh, proving cut admissibility. So, um, first of all, let me, let me say that what happens when uh, we want to prove soundness and completeness. So, uh, two uh, useful definitions uh, here are the definition of a differentiated model and a strengthened model. You don't need to read what's in here. A differentiated model is basically just a model in which there are no redundant worlds. If the worlds are... Uh, 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 agree with respect to satisfaction of the formulas and non-satisfaction of the formulas, there is a single world that does that. There is no, uh, no redundancy, no copies of a given world. And the strengthened uh, thing here is just to say that, um, to guarantee that all accessibility conditions that you need to build the canonical model will be uh, uh, guaranteed to be present in the uh, definition of the accessibility relation. Okay. Now, this is the theorem for soundness and completeness. Of course, uh, for soundness, you want uh, a class of Kripke models that satisfies the appropriate semantic conditions so that uh, nothing goes awry. And for the completeness, what we add is that uh, the models, at least the strengthened differentiated models, have to be present in the uh, class of models that you're building. So any class of Kripke models that contains all these beautiful uh, models in here will and satisfy and our sound satisfy the conditions, the semantic conditions that you expect will be uh, complete for the, for the, um, the sequent calculus formulation that, of this logic here. It's a very general result that just helps us to build the canonical models. It's, it's not the most difficult part of what we're going to show here. So let me uh, show how I can use this for uh, proving other things. So I want to uh, show that these systems are actually quite interesting. And I want to, uh, first of all, claim that I can prove uh, cut elimination for um, the system that I presented and all the ones that I will still present. Though the strategy is, is, is quite simple and it goes through a semantic proof of cut elimination. Uh, first of all, you, uh, you, uh, 
take out cut and as we know when we take uh, cut it somehow forces the models to be bivalent so when you take it out you would expect uh, the possibility of a third uh, value appearing which is what's going to happen here and uh, second um, so let, let me just show the possibility here before I say the second so the possibility instead of saying that phi is satisfied of a world uh, uh, v or phi is not satisfied of a world v when a value is true I say that this happens when true is among the values that you can give and I say that it's not satisfied when false is among the values that I can give to a formula. Why do I say this? Well, because the values that I'm giving to the formulas now are either only true, only false, or both true and false. Three values, right? So the idea here is that uh, by adding this uh, third value, I'm making these models non-deterministic. So a quasi-evaluation for me here will be somehow choosing one of these two values to give to a formula. And if I choose wisely, perhaps I can make it uh, deterministic, as we will see. So the second model, uh, the, the second uh, step uh, that we uh, need to prove cut elimination will be to prove a, a result that depends on the following, depends on building what I call an instance. So uh, if I have something called a quasi-evaluation or a quasi-model, and I want to build a, a counter model in the form of a quasi model, so a counter quasi model. So I will say that uh, an instance of that model is any uh, model, not a, not a quasi model, any model that satisfies the same formulas. So this might not exist, but if that exists, this means that I can transform a non-deterministic model into a deterministic one, which might be interesting. Uh, so the first uh, theorem that we can prove here about this logic uh, that I presented is that uh, quasi-models have instances. So you can always find some model that satisfies the same formulas of a given quasi-model. But notice that this model that you're finding might, might have a different accessibility relation, which complicates things later on when you need these accessibility relations, for instance, to be symmetrical or reflexive, and you might not be able to guarantee it. Okay, but for the moment, I don't need any property, so there's nothing to guarantee, so it's super simple. Okay, so um, how do we prove these two results? I probably don't have time to go through it. It's very, very simple, so I'll just mention I won't write. So first of all, um, I want to show that this logic PK enjoys cut admissibility, and uh, you do it by, by um, contraposition as usual. Suppose that a sequent S is not derivable without cut and then prove that it's not derivable with cut so if it is derivable with cut it's derivable without that's what we want to show now if it's not derivable without cut and i have to hand wave here because i, ha I don't have time to write it will have a counter quasi model because of completeness of these semantics these non-deterministic semantics that i presented in the previous slide now if it has a counter quasi model by the result that I just presented it has an instance so it has a counter model and if it has a counter model by soundness of the Kripke models of the, uh, the the usual semantic the deterministic semantics that I had at the beginning it's not derivable with cut okay so uh, this is a beautiful proof that gives you no extra work and uh, and, and via the semantics uh, you can guarantee uh, what you want but the problem is that it doesn't guarantee that the, there is a decidability a procedure associated to the logic because the rules are very weird. So we need to find some way of saying that there is some notion of analyticity uh, uh, associated to that system. So we want uh, the system to be such that when you apply a rule, if you go from the bottom, from the root of the tree up, you only look at things which are simpler. So the notion of simplicity is this one that I wrote here. There will be a well-founded relation um, uh, on top of the formulas, which is not very important for us to define here, but it can be defined. And you can say that some formulas are simpler than others uh, without them needing to be subformulas. So you have an extension of a generalized uh, notion of subformula. Okay, so uh, the way you prove that this logic is analytic according to this new measure of complexity is just by looking at the rules that we have all the rules respect this in the sense that the input uh, sequence are simpler than the output sequence according to this uh, uh, measure of complexity uh, 
So uh, except for cut, all the rules simplify when you go from the root of the tree to the leaves of the tree. And if we have just proved that you don't need cut, we're done. So we can also guarantee that there is a decidability procedure associated to the logic. There is a notion of analyticity associated to that logic. Okay, you can go further. I'll just very briefly mention what you could do. You could consider the class of serial frames. And for that class, you would have something like the paracomplete negation uh, implies the paraconsistent negation. You can consider the reflexive models in which you would have that the paracomplete negation is explosive and the paraconsistent negation respects excluded middle. You can have um, total functional uh, frames in which the paraconsistent negation and the paraconsistent negation are equivalent. You can impose uh, symmetry on the frames. In that case, you would have double negation elimination for the paraconsistent negation, double negation introduction for the paracomplete negation. And you can capture all this using uh, sequence systems to which all the previous technology applies just the way that I proved before. And in fact, all of them uh, um, are amenable to um, the pretty much the same proofs of cut admissibility and analyticity that I presented before, with some complications on the construction of the canonical models, of course, uh, because you might lose the properties that you want. But you can massage the models uh, so that they will be the way you want. It has to be done one by one. You cannot prove this in general for any logic. So uh, we have proved for these logics, at least, which are uh, well known. And we could um, explore the properties of these logics, which I'm not going to do here. But you could uh, look at what kinds of contraposition these logics have. You could look at the um, derivability adjustments, as I mentioned before, and uh, some basic consecutions in which uh, when would you have things like uh, re uh, possibility of recovering double negation elimination for a certain uh, connective by adding a certain assumption here. Uh, you could have um, lots of things about how can you recover the Morgan rules, how can you uh, recover uh, by using, say, a seriality or transitivity of the frames. You can study all this as a model logician would. Um, and uh, you also have some interesting uh, results about the derivability adjustment. I didn't say much, but for instance, if two formulas are consistent, their conjunction is consistent. If two formulas are consistent, their disjunction is consistent, and so on. Okay, and finally, you can have some interactions between negations, uh, like mixing negations. You can uh, consider uh, the, the consistent negation of the paracomplete negation and see what happens. You can adjust the result. There are many things you can do. This is just calculating, but it's a ni these are nice tables for you to have on your wall if you want to say, let me look for a logic that has this property. Oh, it must be reflexive or it must be reflect serial and symmetric. Great, that's what I want. Okay, so here are some further ones. I will not talk about this. The final slide before the conclusion is this. I wanted, I threw away class negation, so it's only uh, fair that I look at the possibility of defining it in these logics. So uh, if it's not a primitive connective, uh, perhaps it can be defined. For instance, you might be able to set the negation of a formula as this thing here, using the language of uh, paracomplete negation and its adjustment connective. And in that case, you can prove that the logics, uh, the logic with the uh, reflexive frames, but without these connectives can define a negation that behaves classically. And the same, a similar thing for this logic without these connectives can also define the logic with seriality, the logic with functionality, they all can define classical negation. What's more interesting perhaps is to show that some logics cannot define. They can have all the nice properties that I mentioned before, but still uh, you might be unable to define a classical negation. And the way you prove that is simple. Uh, by contradiction, you assume uh, and you do an instru structural induction on the formulas, you assume that you're able to define and you look for all the formulas that would express the class conjugation of uh, uh, an atom P, and you show that if where such formulas to exist, you would get a contradiction. So you can prove that all these logics here, in particular the first one that I presented in more detail here, uh, do not have a classical negation definable inside of them. Okay, so um, to leave you some time for questions, I'm just uh, will conclude by saying further directions we could um, ride into. Uh, of course, we could study all the classes of frames. I mentioned only only some, but you might be interested in studying uh, Church-Russell properties in general, because most of the properties that I said before are particular cases of, um, of the diamond property. 
and um, it can be internalized in that language that I uh, mentioned before by adding this interaction in between the paraconsistent, double paraconsistent negation and the double paracomplete negation. Uh, you might want to have transitivity to have something like uh, S4, but in that case you would have, even if the logic is not paraconsistent, you would have that the negation of a formula when negated itself would explode. So you would have a, a partial explosion. You might want it or not, but again, you have uh, things like this in intuitionistic logic. We add more negations and things start behaving classically. And similarly, for the if you want to have something like S5 and you want Euclidean uh, frames, you, you will have to add the uh, explosive character of the paracomplete negation of P. Now, uh, just to mention two further directions, of course, when you're doing modal logic, you might want to consider interactions between different boxes, different diamonds, because now we have the possibility of doing that. And we have boxes which are positive and those which are negative, and we have uh, same for diamonds. So you might want to uh, see what happens if you add, for instance, modalities that look forward together with modalities that look backward, like in temporal logic. And in that case, you will have many mixed consecutions that you will be able to prove and some that you will be able to recover if you add uh, further uh, properties of the frames. And finally, just to mention, uh, which I find this extremely interesting, uh, and, and I see it in some of the um, results uh, being worked by, by colleagues over there, that I show the factory of looking at sequent contexts and on the top of negative modalities producing interesting semantics. What if we had dual contexts? What if we had uh, things uh, which could uh, allow us to reason on top of negative judgments and we could, uh, we're could we interested in doing um, program th synthesis or uh, looking at modal types which are negative. Uh, I claim that we have not been doing so much this because uh, we often look at modal types from uh, with the glasses of an intuitionistic logician and those uh, people do not seem to believe in negation at all. Negation is just a defined connective that happened to be around because you have implication in bottom. But if you take it seriously and uh, having implication or not, it might be worth considering what's the meaning of uh, negation and of paraconsistent and paracomplete negations from the point of view of things like the Curry-Howard uh, correspondence and what we can do with it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Joao, for this wonderful uh, talk. Thank you for showing us this alternative world. And for sure, the, the future work is very interesting. So please, if someone has any comments or questions, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, yes, I know. Okay. Well, uh, I have a question about the uh, the the, concept, the commercial relation. Um, you know, the Nelson logic is not commercial with yes. the primitive implication, but you can define a new implication. Yes. Which can apply uh, in the multitasking process. Yes. And maybe with this implication, you can uh, the logic is commercial. Yes. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, logic C omega is not commercial, but you cannot define a new implication. In your commercial definition, can recognize this kind uh, this logic? Yes, because the uh, the definition of congruence that I have offered at the beginning it doesn't even need an implication at all, right? Remember, it was just about the situation. It's it's similar to the definition of congruence in algebra, right? It's the it's the very notion of the equivalence being compatible with the interpretation of the connectives, whatever the connectives are. So you don't need to have an implication to define that relation. Uh, you might say, okay, someone gave me this relation, uh, given, for instance, by this um, usual uh, definition, which is the, the, the Lindenbaum uh, equivalence, right? Uh, and you say, well, I want to study congruence on top of that equivalence. So if someone else gives you another equivalence defined by magic, defined like in Nelson logic by considering the negation of a formula also, and not just the equivalence between the formula and another formula, then you can restart and ask the same. Uh, okay, according to that notion, uh, is it enough to guarantee the compatibility condition that we need for, for congruentiality? So um, I think the same applies. Uh, 
it, it's not a guarantee that you will be able to find uh, modal semantics in the in the sense that I presented here because it's defined in terms of the Nelson negation in that case, the strong negation, and that negation might not have, depending on the algebra you're working uh, with, the properties that you need. But in case it has, and it often has, then you would be able to start with this new uh, um, this new uh, equivalence relation. So I just took the simplest one, but I'm not saying that you couldn't do the same work with another one. I think you can. It's just that you have to adapt a lot of things that I presented here before, and perhaps you wouldn't be able to recover, as I said, all normal modal logics, but you would perhaps be able to recover a lot of them, uh, all those from the Nelson family to start with. Thank you. Okay, Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Yes, I have one. Go ahead, Fabio. Thank you, Joao, for the very nice talk. Of course, I have a lot of questions, but here I'm only going to ask one or two things. Uh, first, if, if you can say something about uh, what kind of equivalence we have with the, these smile frown logics with the classical model logics. I mean, do you preserve, can you preserve the structure of the proofs or is it just an equivalence at another level? Well, you have you have this, which is in this slide. You have that. Uh, whatever you do with the negation of box, I don't know why it's not working. Yeah, whatever you do with the negation of box in normal modal logics, uh, you are already automatically doing with a smile. So uh, you can preserve the structure of any uh, proof that you do on the negation of box, right? And if you have the 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 other one. The other one would be this. So this one is the smile and this one is the frown. So the frown, um, if you're talking about intuitionistic logics, you, you don't even need to change anything because interpretation of negation in intuitionistic logic is precisely the one given by the interpretation of this on top of a formula, right? So everything is preserved in that case because everything is already thought in a sense as being just that. So this negation, uh, the frown is just intuitionistic negation. Um, but it, recall that intuitionistic negation is defined usually using implication. And I'm taking this to be primitive, to be uh, present even if implication is not there. If implication is there, it's too easy. But if it's not there, you can still talk about heredity, uh, preservation. You can still talk about all the things you talk in intuitionistic models. They were not very important in this talk, precisely because I had no implication. I had just the language of distributive lattices. And in that language, it makes no difference if I'm talking about uh, um, conjunction in, or disjunction in classical logic or intuitionistic logic. Everything's just the same. The fragments are, are uh, identical, right? The, the in this language with conjunction disjunction top and bottom i could be talking about classical logic or intuitionistic logic it's the same thanks um, the other was so i was thinking all these uh, studies of negation uh, and and uh, the sequence calculus or in general the adoptive systems i wonder if if there are some work of, of you are aware of uh, that uses refutation systems instead of deduction systems. Because uh, I think it, it, it would be, it, it has to, to, to have some advantage to use yeah. refutation systems. Yeah. Um, well, two things. Um, because I have extended the language to have both negations in the same language, so I can't see much of an advantage of going towards one direction or the other because I made things very symmetrical so that if you move into the, into the refutation systems, you will just basically reformulate what you have here on the non-refutational side. But what you say is, is very interesting from the point of view of a language containing only one of these connectives. For instance, containing only, only the paraconsistent negation. Why not study uh, refutation systems for languages, uh, uh, for, for paraconsistent logics. I think very few people have thought about that. Um, I have done a little bit of work in that direction. Uh, 
but I haven't uh, worked with the uh, proof systems for those uh, logics, and I haven't seen what happens if I want to if I were to adapt the uh, technology that I presented here for the proof systems in that perspective. I think it would be smooth, but we need to do it right to see to see if everything runs fine as we expect. But I think it's really interesting to to um, to do that to move from assertional to refutational systems, particularly when the language is biased towards one of the fragments here containing only smile or only frown. Uh, let me just mention this, for instance, in intuitionistic logic, people say, uh, people look at the assertional aspect and say, oh, it's so different from classical logic. There are some classical theorems that which are not valid in intuitionistic logic. And then I say, look, if you were to be worried only about refutations, you would say that it's the same logic as classical logic because it has the same anti-theorems. See, so for intuitionistic logic, you wouldn't want to move to the refutational systems. But for the parallel system logic, you should. Nobody's doing it. Let's do it. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Of course, I, I, I have also remarks and questions about your very last observation with dual context, but we need a long time. We have a project. Yeah, we have a project. Let's work on it. Thanks. Thank you very much for the questions. Okay, the last one from Everardo, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, it's very interesting, this uh, uh, comparison between the, this paracomplete negation and paraconsistent negation with respect to the diamond and the box operators. And at the end of your talk, you, you, you mentioned something about uh, converse modalities. Yes. And uh, I was wondering uh, on, on, on these extensions of, of model connectives, what would be the intuition of these converse negations, uh, paracomplete and uh, very consistent negations, mm -hmm. and in general, what would be the, 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 the intuition uh, with respect to multi multimodalities? Um, furthermore, if there are some some uh, investigations regarding uh, nominals from right. the, the, the model logic perspective, in, in, in contrast with right. consistency. Thank you very much. Uh, there's more than one question. I'll try to uh, recall. So you tell me if I didn't. Um, first of all, the um, the interest of looking at this um, converse modalities uh, is proportional to your understanding or to our understanding of what the usual modalities are. So if we have a good, uh, um, say, computation interpretation, for instance, for the uh, paraconsistent uh, negation, using this uh, idea of looking towards uh, uh, understanding it as, as a, um, a modal type, negative modal type, then you could say, well, um, in, the, in just the same way as in temporal logic, you would be interested in moving in your graph towards the future and the past. Now we would be interested in, in towards alternative futures in which things are different than what they are, are because of the negation, things are inverted, and looking at alternative paths in which things were different from what they actually were by using negation, right? So instead of just moving in the graph, you have an extra uh, judgment that you can do. You, can, you, you move in the graph and you go from assertion to refutation or from refutation to assertion. Okay, so this would be, uh, uh, if you have a good, uh, a good understanding of what's the meaning of asserting and refuting uh, uh, in, in, your, um, in your approach to logic, if you have that previously, then it will uh, feed your understanding, it will help in your understanding of what happens when you add this, the converse modality which looks to the past instead of looking to the future. Okay, so... There are studies about about intuitionistic uh, negation and the backward looking intuitionistic negation. There are studies about this in the literature, and this would be, uh, for instance, one of the directions in which you could uh, you could uh, look at the very same work that I'm presenting here. And the other question that you made uh, was about uh, say a word so that I can remember what was at the end. It was about dominance. 
about nominals yes uh the the work that i that i know that have been done about nominals on top of power consistent and power complete logics was in hybridizing uh power consistent logics uh by manuel martins and diana costa in portugal and they have applied this to um medical databases actually so there there is some work not much that i'm aware of and even applications of this so i could direct you to this if you just send me a message uh, but i think more can be done because as i sh have shown here for instance we can internalize other important properties related to negation they might also have uh, uh, an impact on our understanding of what we can do uh, with these languages and what we can apply these languages to in databases or anything else okay so this was a very abstract uh, presentation without aiming to uh, um, to justify it in terms of applications but I think um, that can that that's that's to be expected and that uh, will come we should look thank at you. it it's, yes it's, thank you it's, it's very interesting thank you Verata. okay thanks for the questions and thanks again Joao for this this excellent talk Thank you very much, Lourdes. Let me just say, because I'm the last speaker, that I wanted to everybody to um, raise their hands and say that we were very happy that you have organized this and have uh, made us be in the same room, even though we are so far away. I'm, I was very happy and delighted to participate. And please, uh, um, please promise me that next time we will be together, if you can. <laughs> end all this pandemia and let us be together again. <laughs>